Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to um, this instance of the linguistics departmental seminar. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to come to terms with restructuring. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have met either. My name is Lutz Martin. I'm at the moment the interim dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and Languages and Cultures. And I'm half of the linguistics section, half in the Africa section in the um, School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, who is uh, Daisuke Shinagawa, who is uh, um, visiting us from Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Um, he's here as a visiting professor for six months till March, I think. Yeah. Um, and he works on African languages, in particular the Bantu languages. He is one of the world's leading experts on the uh, Bantu languages spoken around Mount Kilimanjaro in northern Tanzania. <laughs> yeah. Rude. Um, Daisuke did his PhD, let me just check that. <laughs> uh, hmm. In 2008 in uh, Nagoya University, um, and then taught for a couple of years um, at Kagawa University in the north of Japan and then went to Tokyo to Tokyo a University of Foreign Studies um, two years ago um, to uh, continue the long tradition of studies in African linguistics and Bantu linguistics. Um, his topic this afternoon is on, type, on some typological characteristics and their group internal variation in Kilimanjaro Bantu languages. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lutz. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Lutz and uh, all the members staff of the Department of Linguistics. And I'm very proud to be here, and I'm very proud to, I guess, the, I'm the first person of the speaker from my university, I think. So in, in this part, it's, I'm very proud, and also I'm very proud to be listed in the previous Bantuist speakers. So yeah, I mean, this is what I want to say for the first. Now, so I'm going to uh, talk about the group internal linguistic diversity found in Kilimanjaro Bantu languages from a microtypological viewpoint. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> First, I will briefly introduce an overview of Kilimanjaro Bantu languages and microparametric approach to Bantu languages. Then, I will show you some characteristic features from three major subgroups of Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, namely Rombo, West Kilimanjaro, and Central Kilimanjaro. In section one, it's a little bit hard to See, but in section one, mainly from the data of Lombo, I will introduce some phonetic features which are relatively rare in Kilimanjaro Bantu as well as uh, in Bantu in general. In section two, which will be the most lengthy part in this presentation, I will talk about two topics. One is about an inflectional suffix, which is aga, which is traced back to Proto Bantu stage seemingly dated far back in some 5,000 years ago, I will explain a historical process which leads to its synchronic distribution and some typological correlations regarding its presence and absence. The other topic is on vowel lengthening suffixes, which may tell us about historical contact with the pre-existing pre languages spoken before present Bantu group came into the region. The last section deals with the Ulu language, which belongs to Central Kilimanjaro languages, which are most studied language group in Kilimanjaro Bantu, but still we can find some unrevealed phenomena, which may shed light on his historical processes in Kilimanjaro Bantu and on close Bantu typo typological issues. Okay, let's get into the introduction section. Uh, Kilimanjaro Bantu languages which is spoken in this area. Uh, and I just mentioned it as KB for short, hereafter. Uh, a, a language cluster spoken around Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, which is uh, in border area between northern Tanzania and the Kenyan. And of course, the, and this is a Kilimanjaro area, and uh, you can approach from Dar es Salaam. Maybe you'll take. I don't know, more than 10 hours by bus or something. And uh, from Nairobi as well, you can uh, approach there, I think it'll take something like four or five hours. And, 
And of course, uh, the Bantu languages are affiliated in Benue Congo branch of Niger, Niger Congo language phylum, and the KB is in its northeastern group. According to Guthrie 1917's zonal classification, which is uh, shown in the left hand side, uh, KBs are grouped into E60 and named Chaga group. Though the unitary name Chaga is a standard ethnonym for the people living in the region, since the publication of Gerald Philipson and Marie Lowell Montacu's comprehensive introduction, the name of the language group became to be called Kilimanjaro Bantu languages because some languages of clear linguistic affiliation with this group are also spoken by ethnically known Chaga people, such as Rua, which is spoken by Meru people living in the slopes of Mount Meru, or Gueno on Pare Mountains, which is highly endangered, and Dabida language, which is spoken in Kenyan side. The languages mainly dealt in this presentation is highlighted in the yellow, Rua, and uh, Uru in central Kilimanjaro and the Mku variation of Lombo. And uh, where is that? Yeah, this is uh, uh, geographical distribution as Derek Nas, who is a pioneer of linguistic study of Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, along with Gerald Phipson, points out that, and it is uh, shown in the you know, bottom side, uh, the KBs show much wider linguistic variation than one would expect from a unitary name Chaga. But um, unfortunately, most of the published data of Chaga languages are from very limited languages or practically from one, only one language, which is called Bunjo. It is uh, of uh, Central Kilimanjaro language. So in this talk, I will present the data from other languages than Bunjo in order to show you, I hope, at least parts of such linguistic diversity yet to be known widely. Before going to details discussion of language specific data, I would like to show a brief linguistic overview of Kimanjo Bantu languages. Though the KV shows a wide linguistic variation, there are two basic characteristics which would apply to all the varieties. One is morphologically, morphological complexity of verbal constituents, and the other is tonal complexity. Since the former is the main topic of the following discussion, I just show you a short example illustrating part of tonal complexity. Unlike tonal languages of Asia, whose function of tone is mostly lexical like Chinese, uh, I mean the Chinese dialects, uh, th that is, the tone shows semantic distinction of words in those languages. It is usual in African languages, including Bantu, that the tone shows grammatical function. Let's see the video clip which was taken with my teacher of Ulu language. <laughs> Sorry for the noises. <laughs> Did you find the difference? I actually, you know, so the first one is uh, I see myself, and the other is I see you, right? It's like something the same, but uh, he said, well, you know, there is, of course, the difference, and the, the difference is marked by tone. So the first one, I see myself, is something like that. And uh, this is I see you. Anyone knows the difference? Okay. The f I see myself is jiku woni, hi lo, hi hi, jiku woni. But the second one is jiku woni, hi lo lo hi. So, you know, the tone makes a difference. 
Okay. So and uh, yeah. So this case shows that the tonal difference denotes the difference of person of object. That is, one is re reflexive, myself, and the other is second person singular. And it can be said that it is still a kind of lexical contrast. Uh, that is, reflex marker ku has a lexical high tone, ji ku wo ni so ku. Yeah, actually, this ku itself has a high tone, but this high tone is realized on the following syllable. So ji ku and uh, ji ku wo ni is so. Anyway, so the ku of this, you know, uh, reflexive has a high tone, and the, uh, the second one doesn't have a high tone. So this is kind of the lexical contrast. Uh, as well. However, there are many more examples where tone works to denote purely grammatical concepts such as subcategorization of past tense. So, I mean, the far past and near past can be marked by tone solely. Or uh, polarity, I mean, yes or no, or close type marking is also what we uh, marked by uh, some other uh, Chaga Kilimanjaro languages. Okay. So, and also I would like to mention briefly about the, I mean, the, you know, uh, methods of, the, of, uh, of my study. Next, I want to brief mention the importance of micro-typological approach to Bantu languages. In the sense of general typology, it is the large-scale typology or macro-level typology that contributes to our knowledge of language universals. And one of the outstanding results would be, for example, World Atlas of Language Structure was uh, edited by Hasper Omar Dyer, Gale, and Bernard Conley. But is in, it's shown in this slide. Uh, as Daniel 2011 claims, there are important areas which are not sufficiently covered by macro-typology. In other words, macro-typology by definition is not aiming for deeper analysis of structural variation within genetic language groups, which must be equally essential to understand the language diversity and the universal processes. In this context, there are two major approaches which aim to cover such fields, namely intra-genetic typology, which can be paraphrased and micro-variation typology, and aerial typology. In SOAS, there is a great project working along this line of trend titled Morphosyntax Variation in Bantu, Typology, Contact, and Change, led by Ruth Martin. As shown in the project aims, this project has already set up 142 microparameters in order to capture the structural variation within Bantu. And based on the parameters, linguistic data, including those from under-described languages, are collected and uh, integrated in order to investigate the issues, including Bantu internal linguistic diversity and the process, processes of historical change, including those induced by language contact. My research in Kimanjaro Bantu languages shares their basic aims with this project. Okay, so let's get into the uh, detailed discussion. The first one is from Lombo. Let's move on to the sections of specific languages. As I said in the introduction, uh, I'm intending to show the data which illustrates internal linguistic diversity found in three languages from each major subgroup of Kimanjaro Bantu. The first one is from Lombo and is about phonetic character characteristics. I just briefly present two relatively characteristic phenomena. The first one is about uh, the, this one, interdental lateral approximant, uh, which is something like the, 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 the. Attested not only in Lombo, but in Uru as well. This sound seems the one the one reported in Ian Madison's paper as labial lingual, which is typologically rare in the world's languages. Let's listen, listen to the sound. But it's the, you know, the sound quality is not good. It's not good, but it's something like that. <coughs> uh, the recording is not clear at all, but in typical pronunciation, the tip of the tongue slightly touches the upper lip like this, and both Wombo and Uru, and this sound is realized as allophone of L sound, I mean phoneme L, followed by high back vowels. The next one is postnatal trilling. Uh, 
Yes, in Lombo, dental and bilabial voice stops are rather regularly realized as trills. Maybe you can easily pronounce the sound. <laughs> Trill. And uh, yeah, so let's listen to the sound. Please, be, please listen carefully, uh, you know, the words marked in red. So uh, the second line, vean. Ra and the second one, Akampra. Did you listen to the sound? This is, the first one is a little bit weak, but the second one is uh, rather clear, it's something like that. So, uh, yes, this sound is also reported in another Bantu language, which is called Basa, but this language is spoken in Cameroon and there's seemingly no direct relation to Kilimanjaro Bantu. And Basa has only bilabial trills, while Lombo has bilabial and alveolar. So this is also the you know uh, somewhat rare uh, characteristic of the phonetic level. Uh, yes, and within Kilimanjaro Bantu, this phenomenon is only found in Rombo, and no no other uh, varieties uh, have this kind of the sound. Okay. So this is the first part. And uh, the second part is uh, the data from Rua, which is from West Kilimanjaro. And this is, uh, this must, mm, may be a little bit lengthy, but yes, let's move on. Uh, let's get on to the section two. Here, I will talk about morphosyntactic phenomena limitedly found in West Kilimanjaro, mainly mentioning the Rua language. The first topic is about a vowel inflectional suffix, which is from Aga, but uh, in this language it's, uh, it's realized as a, which is reconstructed in Protoband 2 as aga, and its function is said to be various imperfective, typically habitual. Shown on this slide uh, is one of the parameters set up by morphosyntactic variation in Bantu project, and it is about future tense marking. It says future time reference, how is future time reference formally divided? Um, the answer is different from language to language in Kilimanjaro Bantu, but as shown in the table, uh, with Kilimanjaro languages tend to have one only future, which is marked by a, this suffix, while the others have two or more future distinctions. Right. This, these basic facts have already been mentioned in the literature. Uh, for example, in NARS 2003, it points out that uh, uh, systematic difference of future category between Central Kilimanjaro and Lombo versus with Kilimanjaro. I mean, the uh, Central Kilimanjaro and Lombo has two clear different futures, while uh, Western Kilimanjaro only have one single future. While Philipson and Molahu describes A as a kind of isogloss which divides WK and the rest. That means Western Kilimanjaro only have this A suffix and the others doesn't have. The question here is whether there is a logical correlation between presence or absence of the suffix A and the number of subcategory of future. And my tentative answer is, I think it's possible. I mean, there must be a kind of logical relation. The key is simple. A is an element uh, which is affixed in the final vowel slot. I mean, the, for example, in the first one, ulumanya, it is the first n is a kind of focus marker and lu is a um, subject marker and man, man is a stem. And the, you know, the following it is a, uh, this is a suffix. But this suffix can be divided further into two parts, a uh, plus a. Uh. Uh, first, first a uh, is a, which we call final vowel, but it's not good. 
name, but it's a kind of the inflectional suffix. And the second R is what we call post-final. So there are two, two <coughs> elements. I mean, the, yeah, I wrote it R uh, as a single unit, but this can be divided in two parts, R plus R. And uh, yes, uh, where is that? Mm. Yeah, and uh, R is an element which is affixed in the final vowel slot. So it does mean that R is now, I, I mean, the, the R itself is slotted in the fi uh, final vowel slot or inflectional suffix slot. And the slot is strictly closed for limited number of inflectional suffixes, such as default indicative A, subjunctive E, and perfect past marker ILE, and so on. And all of which are dated back to Portobanto stage. This means that there is little possibility to introduce a newly grammaticalized morpheme in the position. So the position, the final position is closed. So there's little possibility to get into new uh, grammaticalized morphemes. While in languages without R, the future tense is marked in prefix slot. Uh, for example, uh, example four, luechi kappa. In this sentence, echi marks the future, and uh, the right hand sound, lue kappa, lue kappa. In this sentence, e, I mean, the Prefix, I mean, the, just before the stem, a marks the future. Uh, yes. Whereas the ladder open, I mean, the, the 10 suspect marker slot, which is the second from the subject marker slot, was rather open for newly grammaticalized elements. This means that those languages have structural advantage to introduce newly grammaticalized tense markers. Hence, though it is needed to be Verified, verified by descriptive data from other languages, we would tentatively hypothesize uh, that the correlation between the presence or absence of R in one hand and the number of subcategory of future on the other hand. Right, it's a little bit complicated, I think. But do you have any, up to here, if you have any question or? Can I go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so I will go into more uh, complicated place. Uh, uh, well, so another point I want to mention on AGA is a historical process which uh, leads to the present distribution and to historical morphological sp uh, split occurred in war. The first question, that is, why AGA is limited, limitedly found in West Kilimanjaro, is rather, sim rather simple. As mentioned in Mahu on Bunjo, next one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in Nars and Phipps on 77, uh, on Old Moshi, both of which are a CK, Central Kilimanjaro languages, it can be seen that those languages have lost the vowel length contrast in their phonological system. Hence, the long vowel R cannot be realized as it is. The same thing is applied in Rombo, where the vowel length contrasts are neutralized in uh, propose, proposal position as illustrated in seven. So, for example, in the first one is fi noir, which means strip off, imperative form. But uh, morphologically, this is phi nu plus a. But the uh, uh, surface realization is not phi nu, it's phi nu. So, you know, the length is neutralized. But as clearly seen in 7b, if you put another uh, element uh, sentence finally, uh, this u a part or uh, the, you know, uh, stem final vowel uh, can be pronounced. I mean, phi. Finueni, finueni, not finueni. So this is, I mean, the kind of the neutralization of vowel lengths uh, in terms of the position. Okay. So, but while in Lombo, I mean, while in Lua and other West Kilimanjaro languages, the vowel length contrast is kept in phonological system, as, as shown in this slide. Hence, the suffix R can be realized. So the lacking of vowel length contrast can 
be at least one of direct factors of Aga's dis disappearance in central Kimanjaro and Wombo. Then the next process is about uh, the sy systems of languages with R. Philipson and Montreux make a general comment on R which is read as R is a single morpheme and its function is to denote habitual and the future, as is written in uh, the you know, upper side. Uh, but at least the fact in Rwa is different in that R of future and R of habitual is clearly distinguished by tone. We can confirm like this. <laughs> This is a future tense. Iwekuba, Iwekuba na is a uh, the final part of the vowel is, you know, falling tone. But uh, uh, habitual, uh, the tone is flat in the word final position. Very subtle difference, but Iwekuba uh, na. Iriso is a future, but habitual, iwekuba na iriso, it's a very much more uh, clearer if you uh, see the difference of the following noun, I mean the initial syllable of the following noun, iwekuba na, the first syllable is low, but the habitual sentence, iwekuba na iriso, you know, the initial syllable of the noun is realized as a high tone. Yes, and uh, where is that? <laughs> in there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, Yukawa, but, but you know, so uh, Philipson and uh, Montague uh, explain that this, uh, I mean, the, they are not aware of, I mean, the, uh, at least, you know, the language they are working on doesn't have the difference. And uh, also, uh, on the other hand, Yukawa, 1989, uh, claims on A of Mashami, which is also Western Kilimanjaro language, that there are two distinct A's, which is the same situation as in Dwa, and they may have different origin. He said, if the ending A has originated in Aga, the form dealt with here, which is present habitual, is semantically the true descendant of the form which had Aga as ending because Aga in put Bantu stage has a kind of the habitual meaning. Uh, the author is not sure how the forms in 221, 223, I mean the future, have come to have the meaning stated here. The ending A uh, of those forms might have another origin. So Yukawa said, you know, the two different A uh, has two different origins. But my explanation, explanation on this issue is slightly different from Yukawa's. The origin of two different A uh, is still Aga of Protoban II, but it must have split in a certain point in history. Let me briefly explain. And, uh, yes, Aga in Proto-Kimanjaro uh, Proto Bantu stage was thought to be a kind of progressive marker, just as found in contemporary Kivosho, which is shown here, Lusoma, uh, which means I'm reading, this is a kind of the progressive uh, meaning. Uh, and uh, I suppose that this form, or this meaning, is of the something like Proto-Kimanjaro Bantu stage. And the form changed from aga to a, that is, intervocalic g was dropped, which is rather regular sound change in Western Kilimanjaro. So this is like this a, it means uh, continuous or progressive meaning. This is a stage one. And this continuous progressive a was shifting its semantic field to habitual in the future due to the in introduction of a newly grammaticalized continuous marker, K, which is from a verbal stem meaning sit or stay. Uh, and as Haspermat uh, claims that this kind of semantic shift, I mean, from present to, I mean, from progressive to future or progressive habitual is some kind of universally well attested according to Haspermat. So the stage two is invasion of K, which is new, newly grammaticalized marker, which means progressive. And because of this, R uh, is moving, uh, was moving to outside the area, 
or, or in other words, sifting to other semantic field. And uh, stage three is the morphological split of R. But how did it happen? Yeah. Uh, in Rua, there are two types of path marking template. One is for default active verbs or verbs with perfective aspect. Uh, in this template, the verb can be inflected three patterned paths. I mean, path one and path two and path three. This is a you know normal or default uh, template or path marking. Uh, yes. And uh, in this template, the verb can be inflected through parted past, and there is no addition of final elements. While in the case of stative verbs, which are inflected by suffix ie, the first one, uh, or other imperfect forms, the past tense is marked by prefix e plus lengthening of final vowel with a high tone. Please be noted that this template applies not only to predicates with verbal stem, but also to non-verbal stem as in ex uh, existen existential construction, which is in term B. Ni fo is I'm, I am, I'm here. Where its past form is ni fo, ni fo, and this, uh, the stem is, uh, is e fo, but this is not verbal stem. This is a uh, demonstrative stem, okay? That is only uh, yes. That is only a ah of habitual was included in the paradigm of stative conjugation, and as a result, the tonological shape was changed to a. Ah. So there were there is only single a, ah, but there was two different meanings. The future of a ah is placed in this conjugation pattern. And uh, habitual, our ah, habitual is shifted into this paradigm. And it makes that a ah, ah, of future is nothing changed, but the a ah, a ah, ah, of habitual is when it's conjugated to past, it's gonna be a ah, a ah, a ah, something like that. And the output go, goes like a ah, a. Ah. And this is, I mean, the, this is newly formed as a habitual, and this form is replicated to present as well. This is my uh, explanation. So the process can be summarized as in this figure. First, the semantic field of R was shifted to future and the habitual, and only the latter was shifted to a different morphological template for stative verbs, and the two were distinctively, let's say, morphologized. Okay, so this is uh, my explanation. Okay, sorry, this is, this is a little bit um, uh, complicated. Anyway, so, the, but the next one is the final, uh, the last one of this part, uh, which is vowel copy suffix and the final vowel lengthening. The other topic of vowel inflection found limitedly in Ueski Manjaro is about the lengthened final vowel. Uh, as already mentioned, this marker occurs as a past marker of stative predicates in Rua and also found, found in Siha and in another whiskey manja languages. Though its phonological form is a lengthened vowel, uh, morphologically it can be seen as a copied vowel of inflectional suffix, which is nearly equivalent to what is called vowel copy suffix in Bantu. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this one. Uh, the uh, uh, vowel copy suffix is normally uh, functioning as past marking uh, element in other Bantu languages. But uh, in past marking elements in Bantu general, uh, what is most popular is uh, TA marker A, prefix A, as shown in this slide. One and two term A is 78% of the languages in the database have a form of A for making past. And uh, the second one is also the same. Uh, and uh, also, it is used ile. This is the second uh, popular um, form for marking past. Okay. Uh, yes. And the uh, vowel copy suffix is that this is the least frequent uh, element uh, as past marker in Bantu. 
And this ge geographic distribution is sporadic. And if you closely look at the examples, there is a clear difference between uh, typical vowel copy suffix and the length and final vowel in West Kilimanjaro. So this is a kind of typical uh, examples of the vowel copy suffix. Si lawa means I came. The stem is lawa means uh, to come. But if it, uh, it uh, conjugated into past, you know, the final vowel is going to be a, ah, which is the same as a stem vowel. And the second one is a ah, and uh, he or she went or has gone. Uh, the final vowel uh, is the same one as a uh, stem vowel. This is, this is a typical copy vowel suffix. And uh, this is also found in Herero, for example. And, uh, but this is also the same uh, way, I mean, the tua hong, tua, tua honga, is it right, is it right, tua honga, <laughs> is uh, we told. And, uh, but the tua hongo, it is the uh, imperfective past or something, and this is also the same thing, I mean, the, the final O is copied vowel, the stem. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that means that these are different from the case in West Kilimanjaro in that the target of vowel lengthening is final vowel and the lengthened vowel is placed in post-final position. However, the last example from Bila, uh, which is so-called the forest Bantu language, shows exactly the same structure as those found in West Kilimanjaro. So this is a relatively, uh, I mean, the, uh, almost the same uh, structure as Lua's structure. So, you know, uh, the final vowel length things happens in the, you know, word final position. So the, the length and vowel is final vowel itself. So, and uh, I mean, the, in other words, you know, the uh, copied vowel is, uh, is in the post-final slot. Yes, so when it comes to Bila, so this is, a, I mean, the, uh, basically the same uh, construction of uh, West Kilimanjaro, especially Rua. And when it comes to Bila, this language is spoken not only by Bantu people of the Bila area, but also by so-called pygmy people living in the Congo forest. This is a list of the uh, languages spoken by pygmy people, and uh, one of which is Mbuti Sua, and also this is uh, Mbuti Sua people are speaking Bila language. Uh, Yes, and uh, this means that, uh, 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 yeah, so that means that, you know, p uh, pygmy people are speaking this Bila language. And this means that the pygmy people lost their original language and shift to use the language of their neighboring people, Bila. And at least to me, it's a little bit interesting. In folk tales in Chaga people and in historical literature, uh, like uh, by Thomas Spear, it is said that the pygmy people who is called in Wakoningo in Chaga lived in the Kilimanjaro region before present Chagas came into the region. So, but it is very small and slight uh, evidence, but, and also this is nothing but speculation so far, but there, ma there might be small traces of the language of the people, I mean, the, of the language of uh, pygmy people, which is now almost completely vanished. So it's a, that's a kind of speculation, but uh, there may be a you know, slight possibility to know about, uh, you know, old pygmy, or the languages of pygmy is like, okay. So the final part, I think, <coughs> uh, in Sri, uh, I will talk about Uru language. And in this language, we can find some kind of archaic features in Kilimanjaro Bantu languages. The first one is about Aga, which I talked uh, before. So finally, I will briefly pick up some features only limitedly found in Uru, a central Kilimanjaro language. 
all the features can be seen as an archaic theorisis. I mean, I will pick up three features, but all the features can be seen as an archaic traces, which are almost lost in other central Kimanjaro languages. The first one is an alleged residue of Aga, which we discussed in previous sections. I repeat again that, as reported in Philipson and uh, Molehue, it is said that the lyrics of Aga are only found in West Kimanjaro, but, but further research on TA system of Uru shows there seems a residue of Aga, which is high-toned suffix A, and it is only used for present habitual, which is shown in the uh, example 11, Lukaapa ikilili, is, uh, the meaning is, we hit the tree, we hit this tree, or something like that. Uh, but, I mean, we habitually hit uh, the tree. Uh, but uh, luechi kapa, luechi kapa is the past form. So past habitual doesn't have a kind of the height on the R, and uh, actually H part shows the past habitual, but uh, in present habitual, this is a, you know, the final R shows a kind of habitual, and this may be a residue of uh, habitual R, which is not reported yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the one uh, trace of, I mean, the archaic uh, trace of central Kilimanjaro found in Uru. The second one is inflected subject marker. The next phenomena is what seems to be an inflection of subject marker, inflection of subject marker, uh, which is verbal prefix, uh, that is bound morpheme. In 12a, Kopira is ni, I mean, nimremi, nimremi. It's a very uh, typical copula sentence. Uh, someone is a farmer or something. So there is no uh, subject shown in this sentence and it's possible, grammatical, ni, nimremi. Someone is a uh, farmer. So uh, this can mean, the, you know, he is, farm, he is a farmer or she is a farmer or maybe I am a farmer. It's also possible, nimremi. It's a very typical uh, and neutral copula. Right, in 12a, copula is ni, and it is used as present copula for any class, number, or pre person, of subject. Or even with a subject in p, it is itself, uh, np itself, as in this example. But the second example, ku, in 12b, is only used for second person singular. And this is actually homo homomorphic with its subject marker. That is, in Uru, subject marker can be used as an independent copula, but this is not necessarily unusual in KB and in the other brand too. For example, similar examples are found in archaic Swahili varieties. So, uh, I read a little bit long, but uh, 12B is Nkumremi, Nkumremi. This is also the copula plus farmer, but this one means you are a farmer, you know. And uh, this is not used for other person or other numbers. And uh, this first ku is from, uh, actually, so I glossed the, you know, the, under the ku, it is a subject marker, second singular. The ku itself is, a, you know, homomorphic with uh, subject marker, second singular. So this means that, you know, subject, subject marker itself can be used as a copular in this language. But this itself is not so, unfamiliar, right? So in Kimanjaro it's possible, but also I guess in some variety of Swahili it's possible to uh, use subject marker as a copula. But um, however, what is a bit surprising is example 12c, where the subject marker, which is used as a copula, seems to be inflected by tense marking prefix. So the last example is kwemremi, kwemremi. Kwemremi is an something familiar to me, I mean, or something familiar to other Bantuists, because, you know, the subject marker can be used as a copula, but the third one is something strange, I think. So, ku is a subject marker, but e is a kind of the, it's a prefix, tense marking prefix. And uh, it seems that, you know, this example is a kind of, you know, subject marker is inflected by the prefix. 
you know, so in that point, it's a little bit surprising. But, yeah, yeah. Mm, this phenomenon has not been known, at least in other major Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, but we can find similar examples in a grammatical sketch of Gueno, which is a little known language of Kilimanjaro Bantu, and classified outside the three major subgroups. So it is linguistically significant in that it will tell us some archaic features of Kilimanjaro Bantu, which may have been lost in main body of the languages. So as Philip Nas uh, said, I mean, the Gueno itself is a little known Bantu language of Northern Tanzania, and the Gueno is spoken by several thousand people in the Northern Pale Mountains, which is not, I mean, different from the uh, Kimanjaro Mountains. And all Gueno are, uh, and probably have long been bilingual in us, uh, although the reverse is definitely not true. So the language itself is socially very weak. And uh, all of the others, Gasri, Nathan Phipson, and Winter, classify Gueno as a dialect of the Chaga group. Uh, but it is of interest partly because it has long been geographically separate from the rest of Chaga. So Gueno has a kind of the very rare a kind of uh, phenomena. And this Gueno language, in this language, uh, as shown in certain A and certain B, the first form, Fuleke, is analyzed as subject marker, Fu, which is first person plural, uh, and past marking prefix, Le, and locative copula stem, Ke. So this is, and the meaning is Fuleke fu Numba, is a we were at form. So uh, Fuleke part is meaning we were, we plus uh, copula plus past and plus some locative notion, uh, plus Numba, it's very uh, clear. And also Fuleke Fuagwa, it means we were buying. So Fuleke part can be also used as a kind of the auxiliary uh, introducing the progressive uh, bar form. Yeah. However, in certain C and certain D, copula K is dropped, but still well formed as a copulative predicate. Inflected SM in Uru is exactly the same construction. So C and D is uh, in C is A G. So it's, if it's gonna, if it's A K G, it's very clear and it's very you know natural sentence with copula, but. It's okay, I mean, the, in C, you know, the K is omitted and it, still it is well formed. So this is a kind of uh, what I said, uh, inflected SM in Uru. I think this is a, basically the same construction. So, you know, the, what I said as an infect, uh, inflected SM, which is very rare in Kimanjaro Bantu or even in uh, central Kimanjaro, but this is, uh, you know, found in the Gueno language. And the last one, uh, negative particle. The similar example, that is a uh, situation where archaic feature in Gueno is only attested in Uru uh, within three major groups, is the system of negative particles. Most of current languages take an invariant negative particle, as shown in this table. So for example, Rua languages, uh, the negative particle is invariant all the time, you know, ndi, 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 ndi. And for example, in Rombo, uh, the same thing happens. I mean, the negative particle is all the way, ku, 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 ku. But in Uru, it's a little bit strange and it's very interesting that, you know, basically, po can be used all the person and number. But partly, you know, there, uh, partly it's possible to, you know, alternate other form. For example, first person singular, uh, it is possible to use for, but also uh, possible to use ni, which is subject marker, and uh, third, sing third person singular as well. For and o is possible, and uh, the o is a kind of the, it's a subject person, subject marker, it's not subject marker, but it's a uh, kind of the, uh, we call it self-standing pronoun, but it's a kind of pronoun of the third person singular, and the third person plural is the same. Wo is a uh, third person, uh, I mean the, uh, yeah, it's a kind of the uh, self-standing pronoun. Yes, 
So, uh, however, Uru, uh, I mean, so uh, Uru partially retains the seeming original system. I mean, the, if you see the Gueno system, it is very, you know, systematic. Negative, negative particle is, I mean, let's say, the agreeing with the subject uh, person and the number. So, if the subject of the uh, sentence is first person singular, then the negative, negative particle is ni, and if the subject is second person singular, the negative, negative uh, particle is four, something like that. And the uh, Uru system is a kind of the, you know, uh, Uru retains the kind of original system which is uh, attested in Gueno, uh, where negation particle agrees with the person and number of sentence subject. Okay. These features, in addition to the case of Aga, seem to tell us that Uru retains some archaic features which seemingly had shared but currently be lost in other central Kimanjaro languages. This means that the detailed investigation of Uru would shed light for bridging phenomena between central Kimanjaro and other groups which in turn may bring novel findings both for historical places historical processes and typological microvariation. The summary. In summary, what I intended to do in this presentation is to show how diverse linguistic features are found in Kimanjaro Bantu, which, in other words, this language group is very suitable to investigate by uh, the approach of microparametric uh, typology, which is developed by, by Lutz and his project members. And I hope I could demonstrate at least partly that the microparametric uh, micro approach is also beneficial for issues on historical changes. And finally, uh, I hope fine-grained description, description of specific relatively rare phenomena makes the close bound to typology more precise and possible. Thank you very much for listening. And maybe if I may start. Okay. Um, can you go back to the, uh, um, the, in, the inflected subject mark? Uh -huh. It's something here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of curious what is inflected. Uh, you know, it's a question of, of stem and affix, really. Mm -hmm. Because for the first ones, you could think that, that this is, you know, it's a copula which is inflected. So in mm -hmm. 12b, mm -hmm. In a, I mean, even a copula is sort of auto inflect, but it's better to inflect a copula than the subject mark, I think. Mm, 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 mm. Um, and then I'm not sure about the C, but if you go to the next next slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. These, the 13 C and D, mm. not D, 13 C. Right. That's interesting because that, that what now follows is an inflected verb. Um, Ah, yeah, 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 yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's examples like that in Southern Bantu and Guni languages where you have, historically, it's a bit like, it was almost like John was dancing, mm -hmm. but the, the was in flex and the dance in flex. So, so John, he was, he danced. Mm -hmm. And then you did something like, Ngi Nga Natsa. Anybody with Zulu? Oh, okay, then we have to put trust on that one. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, I think it's, I, I am drinking, I'm about to drink, I'm not sure what the exact inflection mm. is, but so the ngi is the subject mark at first uh, singular. Mm. And the nga also like the subject, looks like a subject marker for itself. So actually, it should be nga ngi nasa, not ngi nga nasa. Nga ngi nasa, ngi subject marker ah, mm. the historic, you know, auxiliary, whatever. Mm -hmm. That has gone down to the inflected drink. So, ngi natsa is just drink. So, what you have was, I, I was, or I am, I drink, and the whole thing gets together, and then you have essentially, you know, the, so that you can see it, there's different stages. The modern form is just nganatsa, mm -hmm. but you can see in older forms how it all was done together. So, this looks a bit like that, but then the question is, what is the ye? 
-hmm. because the R is the subject marker, the R is the subject marker, and what you gloss, gloss then 13 C as past perfect or perfective. Perfective, I think. So, so if the analogy with Zulu is right, this ought to be an old, old auxiliary. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so then C is yes, actually, so our gay part is uh, functioning like an auxiliary. But yeah, what is important is this on certain D. Yeah. So as you said, you know, is uh, the case in certain C, we can see R gay is a kind of the auxiliary, and maybe gay can be reanalyzed as a stem mm, mm, mm. of the auxiliary. But so this one, ni gay is you know, ni is a cop. Yeah, it's, this one is subject mark, and also it is used as a copula. Where you know, mm. to me, it's a it's a kind of the inflected by gay. Well, you know, as you compare the, you know, the, for example, certain B, uh, under certain A, I think, Fuleke, you know, it's a very straight copula, mm. and uh, at, uh, at least uh, according to Nas and Philipson, and our Philipson and Nas, uh, they uh, think that, you know, Fule uh, this case, this one, Nigeke, is a kind mm. of shortened form, or a mm. form which is dropping the K. Mm. 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 Um, thank you, yes. Could the, uh, the gay and the lay be the same thing with uh, some phonological change? I'm just asking because in Kenyan, there's only in Bantu languages, you get ore, so you have re, which comes as an auxiliary from to be. Mm -hmm. You get ore, or you get uh, bare, or you get agreement. Right, like right. I mean, the, the same kind of thing. Mm -mm. Historically, how, how do, what do you think? So, I mean, historically, that. The le in this case and the le in Kenyan Swahili is maybe the same one, I think. But uh, this, I mean, in this case, it's not the same. I mean, the le is a past marker, and the li is actually, you know, the li of the um, past, I mean, the protoban to li can be used as, a, or can be, you know, reconstructed as a copula. But that one is, I think, different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How many of you are master students? Wow. Okay. This is great. I think what we can play next time when you come to a talk, rather than just listening, you listen with the view of what is my question going to be. Yeah? And then at the end of the talk you have a question. Does that make sense? You don't you don't have to develop for no. It's a, it's a useful way to engage with the talk and then it's more exciting as well. So one question, if I can move maybe to methodology, you showed us where you had interviews with, you know, you looked for tones. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more where these data are coming from? Is this elicited? Are these texts? Is it from the literature? Do you find variation between what you found and what you found in the literature? So, so it's, I mean, it's very data rich, mm. but it's also, I mean, you have very detailed data. How, do, how did you get that? Well, so this is, actually, this is a, not, not a recording session, I mean. This is a kind of the, you know, video shooting, of the, I mean, the usual uh, daily e research e setting. Where, and the, but uh, this is basically the illustration. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, so how do, you see, how, how do you say I see something and how do you say I see myself, how do you say something like that? So this is basically the illustration. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, to me, it's a very big uh, task to uh, do very good research of the you know non irritation way so to me you know it's um, I, i'm still struggling with how can i do uh, to get a very good data of natural conversation mm. Mm -hmm. yes you know, thank you very much <coughs> somewhat related to that, uh, there was an example you gave uh, with Finua. <laughs> uh, I don't remember what it means, Finua, uh, which uh, is transformed to Finua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Describe it as a neutralization. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how, how does that distinct from simply breaking hydrates by inserting a light? Ah. Uh, this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Finua. Mm, but so actually, so it depends on the. Mm, it depends uh, from dialect to dialect. So I mean, the, in maybe in other languages or in other varieties, you know. So this may be uh, blocked 
by the hiatus breaker. Uh, but I think in Swahili, is, I think, or maybe Zanzibar Swahili takes a, such kind of you know hiatus breaker, something like L, I think. If, he, if I you know apply this to the Zanzibar Swahili, I think this may be Finu Ya or something like that, Y or L to be inserted. But in this language, you know, the hiatus breaker is not inserted. It's not. So, uh, the, what was the question? Yeah. I, mean, okay. <laughs> I was just wondering, yeah, I think it's just about terminology. I think you said it's a, um, it's a neutral line. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, this is a neutralization of length, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Length, so length neutralization. Mm. Can you go back to the four, the negative particle in the uh, Negative okay. particle, maybe... Uh, the last one, I think. Here. Ah, here, right. Yeah. So here, basically, in Uru, you have the choice from the first singular, the third singular, and the third plural between two negative particles, the four. Correct, yes. And the self standing for now. Mm. Um, I guess the four is the one which was inherited in the language. And then the ni, the bo, and the wu. Were innovated or were they borrowed? I don't know. If they were mm. borrowed, could it be from Bueno? Mm. Are they mm. losing out? So that, but as, as, as far as I know, Bueno is very, it, you told it, it's, mm. it's an endangered language, so it seems hard to think that Uru could have borrowed mm. um, such a thing. I mean, how, how would you explain that? How would you explain the fact that it's restricted to only third persons, the first and the first singular and the first plural? And, and how is it? Is it freely interchange, interchangeable? Is mm. one taking over? Is the free self-standing pronoun taking over mm. uh, the, the full one for these three persons? I mean, can you yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, actually, so what I'm thinking is that, you know, the original system would be that of Gueno, I think. So all the negative particles uh, uh, you know, uh, agreeing with a sentence subject. So this is a kind of Uru case, or Uru system is a kind of the, let's say, the residue of the original system. But I don't know, but yeah, yeah, of course you can say that, you know, this is a, a result of the language contact, but uh, this is, you know, all this is the, in the same geological and uh, genealogical uh, group, so this I mean, uh, I don't need to say this is a result of the contact. I think it's rather, uh, you know, they are sharing the same origin and, uh, you know, uh, Gueno is following the original one, but uh, Uru is, you know, retaining something, but it's not complete system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, what about the before? I said it was inherited, but it's probably a grammaticalization process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know what's the origin? I mean, the origin of Paul. Oh, yeah. This is the point, I mean, so, yeah, uh, actually, so this is disputing a bit. I mean, the, in the paper of uh, Mod Divorce and uh, Aguilera, and uh, they mentioned about this uh, phenomena, and they are not, they don't have clear answer, you know, what is the origin of Paul. Where, what was my answer? <laughs> I think, yeah, actually this one, in about Bueno, they are wondering, you know, for where, where the four is coming from. So one possibility is from cross 17, uh, locative. And uh, the other possibility is second person singular, cool. And, uh, you know, they are wondering which, which one is uh, correct. But I guess, uh, at least in Uru, for maybe from second person singular, I think. And uh, because, you know, if you, if you closely look at the system or paradigm of the uh, pronouns, I think, you know, that tells you uh, the four maybe from second person singular. But what I'm thinking and what, as long as I know, this case, Will's case, may be from, I think, class 17. So there is, you know, discrepancy between the two. So, 
to me, it's, uh, mm, this is what I know up, mm, up to now. I'm wondering if there's anything kind of just personian going on with the, with the markers. I mean, can, can, would there be any way? Would there be any way to see? I mean, in Gueno, I mean, they're 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 very much like they're much less regular. Mm. It, it would be interesting to see. I mean, is Gueno? Do they use it more? And whereas, like a language like Ruan and Ku would use these would use these mar markers less. Mm -hmm. Do you do you know where I'm where I'm going with this? Where 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 you know that these these final markers could be kind of on their way out, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. negative marking actually on the lexical verb or before the lexical verb. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than, I guess, in comparison to Gueno, where you actually have this, this kind of full, I, I suppose, inflected set. Yes, yes, yes. You mm -hmm. know, so, so on, the, on the verb itself, do you, do, you get, do you get negative marking, or is that the only marking? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Actually, so, yes, in Kiban Joban too, I think there is no language which has pre-initial negative marker. So, but it has an, a kind of post-initial post negative marker, but they are used only for, I mean, non-main clauses. So, in main clauses, you know, uh, the negative marking is only by the, you know, sentence final particles. This is mm, all languages, yes. Mm. You know, it seems to me that the locative is a much more plausible one. Mm. So, I mean, second person singular is a grammaticalized form for negation. Doesn't, I, mean, I, I don't think I've come across it. Whereas with the, with the location one, mm. that's in like the French. I mean, it's step, but there's a sort of. You know, yeah, there's a space element in the, mm. So I think that's that, you know, to me that seems more plausible. Mm. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, and in that case, I think we are probably going to have drinks at the Institute of Education in about 10 15 minutes' time. Mm -hmm. so that five it would be. Um, and yes, please, anybody feel free to join, and then we maybe have some food after that. Uh, but before that, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.